Hallelujah. We thank God you've tuned into this message by David Entry at Caris Church. No hand can help you with the fulfillment of your destiny, but the word of God. May God's hand align you further into your destiny through this word. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Well, it's nice to see everybody on this wonderful Easter Friday. And it also happens to be our day 82 of our daily prayer services. Day number 82. And every day, every day practically, is about three hours of service. Sometimes there's the temptation to go more. But practically every day, averagely, three hours of service. And so you are talking about three hours for 80 days. That gives you 240 hours. 200. It just seems like the upper room, they were there for 10 days. They didn't leave. So 10 days, 24 times 10, to 240 hours. So, yeah, some of you can understand it. Don't worry. Yeah. It's just. So after the. 240 hours, the other six hours, which is the two days one, it's just, it's, it's just, it's just an addition, you know, that, but after 240, they waited for 240 hours, and Bible said suddenly, but look at what is interesting. What is interesting is in the verse one says that, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The day of Pentecost was given to the people by God. He told them that they, they, God told them, you celebrate this day every year. So it's a yearly event on divine calendar given to his people that every year this must happen. And so they prayed and waited and when the day came, something broke loose. An annual celebration given by God. They kept praying till that day came. Okay, some people didn't get it. Today is Easter Friday, which traditionally from the Jewish calendar is supposed to be Passover. 3 p.m., the lambs were slaughtered. The lambs were slaughtered 3 p.m. on the day of Passover, and that was the same day Jesus died, 3 p.m. Because it was the Lamb of God slaughtered. And so when the day of Easter was fully come, (laughs) you understand that? We've been praying and praying for 240 hours. And it's, it's just, now after 240 hours, we were waiting for the day of Easter. So I am convinced. But you know when the, when the day of Pentecost came, I, I, I have this. The Bible talks about how um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, they went to the upper room. And he mentioned the disciples. And then Peter assembled with the 11. And they had to appoint a 12 person. So it looks like just a few disciples who gathered. I'm not sure whether all the 500 people who have seen Jesus came. Or it started with just them. And then by the time of the day of Pentecost, they've increased to 120. So that supposes that not everybody was there from the beginning. But everybody who was there on the day of Pentecost, verse 3, verse 3 said that clothing tongues as of fire sat on each. Uh, It was not so much about who was there from the beginning. It was very much about who connected on the day, the day, the day. Oh, and I announce to you that this is the day. 
to this afternoon is the day of divine visitation. Divine visitation on somebody's life. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter whether you have been part of it from the beginning or not. If you are connecting this evening or this afternoon, I announce to you that the day is coming upon you. The visitation is coming upon you. If you believe it, shout yes. Shout yes. Hallelujah. Somebody is being visited. Well, please be seated. I want to read from Revelation chapter 1. And I read the verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Let's pray, Father, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. So as we get into your word, let your glory be on display. The glory of the cross, the glory of your wisdom, the glory of your purpose and plan. Let it be on display as we get into your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. One of the things you have to know about God is that he, because he's a righteous God, he has to punish every evil doing. A righteous God cannot overlook sin. So he will, God will punish every act of sin. He will. He has to because he's righteous, because he's just, because he's pure. He has to punish every act of sin. And Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says that, Don't be deceived, God is no more. For whatsoever a man sows, so shall he reap. So if everything you do before you, go, you came to Christ and after you came to Christ must be accounted for so long as the righteous demands of God are concerned. So it's as I taught some time ago, it looked as if God was weak. God was not righteous enough because when you look at the Old Testament, the way he should punish sin was not done. Abraham shouldn't have died without his lies about his wife being settled in the in the records of God's righteousness. It's like Abraham shouldn't have died without his going off to have Ishmael with his servant. It being dealt with by the justice and the mercies of God. Because God never chose Ishmael. That means that God was not in it. Jacob lied to his father to get a blessing. And it seems like he went scot-free. Many people, Solomon, Solomon. And when, when we were reading the book of Kings, the things we saw about how some of these kings were wicked. And some of them got away with it. It seems like God didn't do anything. What kind of God is this? Seems to be a weak God or he's not righteous enough. Look at David, the best of all the kings. He had certain issues that he went into his grave with, which seemed like God didn't really deal with. So in the Old Testament, as I taught some time ago, it looked like God was a weak God. He didn't have the backbone to deal with sin the way it should be dealt with, and yet he's supposed to be righteous. 
Not, it wasn't because he was weak, but it was because he deferred the punishment to a particular season. So the cross was the junction where future punishments and past punishments were all punished, were all executed by God on the cross. That's why the cross, Paul said, when I came to you, I did not seek to know anything amongst you, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, except Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says that, verse 18, it says that we, for the mess, the message of the cross is foolishness, but it's foolishness to a category of people. How do you know who is going to hell when the message of the cross is foolishness to them? Oh, this nonsense. I don't like this. How can I? I'm too intelligent for this. You know, I'm, I'm very academic. I'm too intelligent for this. How can you tell me someone died on a cross and it, it cleanses my sin? I'm too intelligent for I'm too. You're so intelligent you didn't realize that there was mess in your family. Where is that intelligence? Bible says that to those who are perishing, how do you know a person who is perishing? When the cross, the message, no, the, it's, it's a message. They said now, it's, the cross is not happening now. So those who are wearing dark dresses and going to the cemetery, no, it's not, we are wasting your time. The cross is a message now. It's, and one interesting thing about the cross is that when the cross was happening, the people who were there didn't even know what was happening. Yeah. The Pontius Pilate who uh, sanctioned his execution didn't know the meaning of what he was doing. He didn't know it. Even the disciples, they wouldn't have been crying. They didn't know. They, and the people who were passing, those who said, crucify him, crucify him, they didn't know the significance of the crucifixion. Mary was crying at the cross. Why? Because she didn't know the significance of the crucifixion. They didn't know the, the centurion. He said, indeed, this is a son of God. He said it, but he didn't even know. He thought, it, because Jesus was not the only one to die on the cross. That was the Roman style of execution. It, it was it's believed by historians that in the time of Jesus Christ, over 30,000 people were executed on the cross by the Romans. So Jesus' cross was not like a special cross to the Romans. It was one of their crosses. So if, if you are wearing the cross and you are not in Christ, you probably was, was wearing one of the crosses. <laughs> I know you have a cross hanging in your car, but you are not in Christ. It's probably one of the crosses, one of the 30,000 crosses. <laughs> it only becomes the cross that takes away cares when you believe the message of the cross. The cross has a message. It's not just a cross. It has a message. And it is the message of the cross that saves. It's the message of the cross that redeems. It's the message of the cross that delivers. It's the message of the cross that brings the glory of God to bear. It's a message. So you could have been there when Jesus was crucified and still be perishing. Wow. You could, have, you could have been there and believed that this is a good man like the centurion. Pontius Pilate didn't want to kill him. He wanted, he washed his hands. He washed his hands. In John, in John chapter 19, he brought him to the people and he was robed in purple and he had crown. So just was mocking him. They had a ton of crown. And if he felt, I've punished him enough. I've given him whips, scorched him, and pierced his back. So they should be happy enough. They said, no, we are not happy. We are not satisfied until we see this guy crucified. And they said, he said, take him and go and crucify him yourself. They said, no, we can't crucify him. They couldn't say he must die on the cross. They said, 
by our law, we can't crucify him. Because the death that saves is the death on the cross. And it was only the Romans who executed that way. So he must die a Roman death, even though he was a Jewish man. Even though he was a Hebrew man, he had to die a Roman death because the Bible has already said in the, in the law that curse is everyone who hung on the tree. So he can't die in the valley. He can't die through stone. He must hang on the tree that the blessing of Abraham will come upon us. The Gentiles also. So Romans had to do it. Pontius Pilate was boasting in John chapter 19. That don't you know I have the power to release you? He said, you don't. You don't. You don't have the power to release me. You have been granted the ability, the power to authorize my execution. It was granted you, but you don't have the power to release me. So you are a puppet. Just go on and do your work. In the, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, two verse 23, he says that uh, uh, him, according to the foreknowledge and the determined counsel of God, by the, 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 he was delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. What they did was lawless. Yes. But it was timely. Yes. It was lawless, but it was godly. Not their actions was godly, but the, the, him dying on the cross was godly. Someone say the cross. So he said, First uh, Corinthians chapter one verse eighteen: the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. How do you know who is going to hell as it's there? If you are perishing, the cross doesn't make sense to you. You haven't embraced it. That means you're on your way to hell. It doesn't matter how religious you are. But to us who are being saved, the message, not the cross, the me it is the message not just the cross. The message of the cross is called the gospel. The gospel stems out from, the, the word gospel stems out from an Anglo-Saxon word, meaning God starts from God spell. God spell, which is the God, God, and spell is story. God story, the gospel. So the, the English word gospel, okay, is an Anglo-Saxon word, God spell, gospel, which eventually became good news, means good news. And the, the uh, Greek word that was translated gospel is evangelion. And so they took the evangelion and they translated it as the God spell, which is now gospel, which is good news. So it's good in every sense. Do you know that if it's announced that it's going to rain or the weather is going to get very cold again, let's say we are going to dip to minus five degrees. Minus five degrees and the roads are going to be shut. You know that's good news for some people? Oh, yes. oh, that's good news for some students. <laughs> that's good news for some employees. But bad news from some employers and business owners. That's good news for people who sell coats and hot water bottles and the energy companies. It's good news. But bad news for us. So sometimes one, one thing is good news here, but it's bad news there. The same thing. But as for the gospel, Come on. for the gospel is good news at all times. Good news to all men. Start good news. That's the gospel. And it's the, the gospel is the message, the message of the cross. That's where the God, the real, you can't have the gospel without the message of the cross. That is why I taught you that almost all the gospel, not almost, all the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spent chunk of their writing on the cross. None of them missed it. Some of them didn't even mention the, um, the, the birth. 
Two of them didn't mention the birth, but all the four of them were heavy, heavy handed on the gospel. On the cross, oh, sorry, the, the death, the burial. None of them missed the death, none of them missed the burial, and none of them missed, missed the resurrection. Because it is the it is the the center, the center of what God can do for man. The center of what God can do. The cross. That's why it is good to celebrate the cross not only on an on a, a special day. Every day, our preaching must be built on the foundation of the cross. Our Christianity must be built on the foundation of the cross. Our church must be built on the foundation of the cross. You, your, the value of who you are before God is built on the foundation of the cross. Paul puts it this way. God forbid that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ my Lord. Galatians chapter, chapter, chapter 6. God forbid that I should boast because the cross is the center of anything Christianity. Now, I read, we read in uh, the readings, we saw in 1 Corinthians how he says that to those who are perishing is foolishness, the, the message of the cross or the preaching of God is foolishness, but to those who are saved is the power of God. The, ne the next verse says that, verse 19 says that, for it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom. God says, I'm not going to go with what human beings figure out. Right, so in the verse 21 said, in the wisdom of God, it pleased God that through the wisdom of God, the world through the means of intelligence, through the means of what the world thinks that this is wise, this is good. God planned that through that means, you won't, the, the world will not find God. Other than that, those who find God will be those who have uh, more money to, to pursue the highest level of education. They will find more God more. They will know more about God. But it has pleased God that in his wisdom, in God's way of doing things, in his operating system, he has pleased God that he will not put the, the discovery of God and his plan and his wisdom and his grace and his blessing, he will not put it through in, on the path of human research, human intellectual research. So there's no intellectual pathway to God. If you are looking for God, it doesn't start from your mind. Starts from your heart. Hallelujah. So Paul said that to those, to the Greeks, he said the Greeks ask for wisdom. The Jews ask for sign. If you are, if you are a prophet from God, if you are the Holy One, then do miracles like the Moses, like Moses did miracles. Moses, when God was sending Moses, he said that take this rod by which you do signs. So God showed his presence with Moses by signs. And the Jew says, the Jew said, if this religion is true, just show us the signs. They only they always ask for signs. Always ask for signs. Do this. Jesus did all the signs, but it wasn't enough for them. And they crucified Jesus not because of what, something he did. He didn't do anything criminal. That is very important to understand when it comes to the message of the cross. Yeah. I'm going to mention it in a minute and then we wrap up. The when it comes to the message of the cross, it is not because he did something criminal. Jesus didn't do anything. He was the most perfect person who ever lived. And yet he died the wildest and the most vile death, execution. He didn't kill himself. They killed him, executed him, and they crushed him. They killed him. Dying on the cross, you see, when human beings are killing you, the punishment for the wildest offense. Some people, they do it through being isolated. They'll make you lonely, or they'll isolate you from your family, or you'll be lonely. Some also, they'll kill you by ex uh, ex torturing your body. Some too, you, you, you will die by, they, everybody will reject you. They'll make sure that you are rejected and you suffer as much as possible. Jesus Christ dying on the cross is like a combination of all that. So there's no human way of killing and that or punishing people that was not signified by the cross. Rejection, loneliness, abandon. In fact, human beings abandon him and most, when you commit crime and people abandon you, it's human beings who have abandoned you. But Jesus is not only human beings. The earth rejected him, and for the first time, heaven also said no. 
Why? Because of the sin of man that was on him. Heaven turned and he said, Eli, Eli. That was the, the most painful thing that he, that's what he dreaded. He wasn't afraid to die because his disciples were not better than him. They were dying singing. They were dying. They were, they were, they put uh, uh, um, oil and coal or not coal, um, soot and oil on them and, and, um, anything that will make things burn. They will put on them and they lighted them like torches to light the streets. That's what they did in the Roman times. Nero killed them, but they were going to be eaten by lions and they were singing hymns and praises. Why would Jesus, their master, going to death and you'll be crying, oh, please don't, oh, please don't kill me, oh, please don't kill me. No, Jesus would not say, please don't kill me. When his disciples were say, bring it on, bring it on for his sake. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus. So when he said, if it is possible, let this cup come pass, he was not making reference to just death. He was making reference to the cup of rejection, God turning, the separation between him and God because of sin. That was what he feared. And the Bible says that the Jews asked for a sign. A, a sign. And the Greeks asked for something. Tell me something that makes sense to me. But he said that we preach Christ to the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greeks, an offense. But, verse 23, oh my goodness. He says that, but to those of us, those, those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. You cannot preach the cross without talking about Christ. And if you are going to talk about Christ appropriately, it has to be connected to the cross and the resurrection. So, as I was saying, God has always, God has always been just and pure. So a just judge must punish sin. God, he has to punish sin. He has to punish offense. He has to punish every form of wickedness. You can't escape. The police may not get catch you. <laughs> but God. And so that means all the sins that have been committed in the past, what is he going to do about it? He has to punish it. He has to punish it. But he postponed or deferred the punishment. So the punishment was still waiting. You know, sometimes when somebody's found guilty in the, in the court, they say, you come back for the sentence. He's guilty, but they say, he's oh, coming back two weeks' time <laughs> for the sentence. <laughs> so, so David was guilty, but God said the sentence will happen uh, later, hundreds of years later. Even when he dies, I'll, I'll punish him. I'll punish him. It's only God who can still punish you even after you die. It's a just God. No, the police might not be able to do that. The courts cannot do that. But God, when you die, if I, that's when he can punish you better. <laughs> because that one, you are not dying again. The wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 3 makes us to understand that all have sinned. So no one can meet the standard of God. And everyone deserves punishment. Death is, watch this. Physical death is separation from people. Spiritual death is separation from God. Jesus was separated from people and was separated from God. Now, the, the core thing about the death of Christ or the message of the cross is what was, hap what was actually happening when Jesus was dying. Because when he was dying, it was actually... He was going through a process because God has to punish sin, and it was an accomplishment. In fact, the Bible says in this way, I, I like the, um, the American Standard Version. I believe the English Standard Version will also say it. But Ameri the New American Standard Version puts it this way. Wrote, um, Luke chapter 1, verse 68. He has accomplished redemption. Yeah. 
Redemption was an accomplishment. Visited us and has accomplished redemption. Wow. He said he has achieved something. Christ on the cross was working. He was accomplishing. God was accomplishing something. He was accomplishing something for God. Redemption then comes into, into play. Watch this. This is very important. Redemption is to buy back. So if he redeemed us, it simply means he bought us. One, bought us from where? And from whom? He bought us. All have sinned, right? And are falling short of the glory of God. And what is the wages of sin? Yeah. What is the wages of sin? Yeah. So that means that all must die because all have sinned. So if all have sinned and all must die, that means you are walking around having party, but there's a death warrant on your head, a death sentence on your head. It doesn't matter who you are. You you can be the, 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 the most righteous or the most religious person and the most well-behaved person, and yet there is a sentence of death on your head, including David and Moses, including Abraham and Isaac, including Jacob and Elijah, including Elisha and Zachariah, everyone, including Mary and, and Elizabeth, all of them, there was a death sentence on their head once you arrived. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. There is a death sentence. So as it is, because of our sins, we were slaves. Slave, and, and we were on the slave market of sin. Slave market of sin. Slaves. Slave market. Because of our sins. So somebody had to buy us by paying in our place. That's redemption. He has to, someone has to pay because an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You can't use a goat to pay for a human being. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can, you can use a, a, a horse to pay for a hen, right? Because it's bigger or for maybe a goat. Because it's bigger, unless it's in matter. But okay, a cow. You can use a cow to pay for a goat. Because that's bigger. So you, you kill somebody's goat, say, no, no, I'll give you a cow for it. Well, that's fine then. If, if, if some, someone messes up, let's say, your, your small car, maybe uh, Ford Fiesta or something, and he said, no, don't worry. I crashed your car, but I'm going to give you um, a Tesla. <laughs> I know you like Tesla. Electricity. I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to give you, or I crashed your Mercedes, but I'm going to give you a Rolls Royce. <laughs> what would you say? You say, oh, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind. That's fine. I don't mind. But he crashes your Mercedes or your BMW, yeah. and he says that, oh, I have some oh, oh. <laughs> Fiat Punto, Nissan Leaf. <laughs> Nissan Leaf, and I'll give you. So no. So when the insurance are writing off your car, they have to give you a compensation payment that is at the same level or more. It might, if it's more, you don't have a problem. Doesn't matter how much you like your car. No, come on, they are giving you more. In the same way, we were on the slave market and someone has to buy us. You can't use a, a creature who is low in value and great to human nature or to human value. And so God has to find another man. But the problem is if you bring another man, the man also is also, there's a death sentence on his head. There's a death sentence on his head. So what no man can die for another man because we are all sinners and we are falling short of the glory of God. And so it takes someone who is pure, who is holy, who has never sinned, who is sinless, who is faultless, to come to the slave market and he said, I'm going to buy. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20. He said, you were purchased by the precious blood cover Shaddai. Hallelujah. For you were bought. Somebody say you were bought. Let's all read your love from the screen. Let's go. You were bought as a price. You were bought as a 
uh, first Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Bible says that by the precious blood of the Lamb, by the precious first Peter chapter 1, verse 19, but by the precious blood of the Lamb, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. In, Ro in Acts, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, eight, which the shepherd, the shepherd, the church of God, which is purchased. So there have been some purchasing. There have been some transactions. And what he used to purchase is the blood. Is there with his own blood. So when he was going, oh, oh that's now I'm, I'm getting to the cracks of my message. When he was going to the cross, he was going to pay for sins. That's why in those days when you owe somebody and the, the bailiffs keep coming to your house and you go to court or eventually you pay everything, maybe payment plan. If you haven't paid, there's still a charge on your life. But once you pay, they give you a certificate from the court, which is tetelestai. That means paid in full. Or you can call it, it is finished. And then you post that on a tree or a notice board on your house, somewhere where everybody will see. Did you understand why he was crucified in public on the cross, where everybody will see? And he said on the cross, John chapter 19, verse 30, it is finished. Someone say it's finished. Someone say it's finished. Sit down, let me wrap, wrap this thing up. It's a message. How can you be saved when you be believe in the wrong gospel? You can, you can, you can be saved. So he, buy, he, he bought us from the slave market of sin by paying the price to who? Not the devil, but to the justice of God, because God has to punish sin. God has to punish sin. Someone must pay for this. But within God's system of operation, he has also designed it in such a way that if you owe me, someone can pay on your behalf, and it is still legitimate. I can accept you owe me 1,000 pounds. He said, I don't have it. And then he, your brother comes, or your friend comes. He said, I have my thousand pounds. He said, this is it. I can't say I don't want it. I want the money from him. That was the meaning of that. <laughs> What's that? It's money. It's debt. And debt can be paid by anyone yeah. on somebody's behalf. Yeah. So in God's system, when it comes to his, judge, his justice, anybody can pay for somebody so long as they meet the criteria. Yeah. So if you want to pay, if I'm owing the bank thousand pounds and you want to pay for me, make sure you have enough money. Even if it's 900 pounds, you can't stand for me. So you must have thousand or more <laughs> to be able to pay for me. Does it make sense when he says that he was spot at the lamp without spots? It's perfect. It's, it's no sin. Does it make sense? When we read in John chapter 18, sorry, chapter 19, when verse 4 and verse 6, Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in him. He wasn't a religious person. He was a political person. He examined him thoroughly. But he said, this is a perfect, a perfect price. A perfect, spotless, without spots. And so he, why, why would you kill an innocent man? He had to be innocent for his blood to work for us. Well, because we are guilty. Bible says that we all have gone astray like lambs. That's what Isaiah chapter 53. We read it. Verse 7 said, For we all as lambs have gone astray. Who? 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 It says that for we all, as uh, 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 we all like sheep have gone astray. How many of us have gone astray? All. How many? All. We all have gone astray. We are astray from what? From the, 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 the judgment, of, from the law of God, from the law, to, from the righteousness. Of, we've missed it. We missed, girl, you missed it. Boy, you missed it. The righteousness of, you missed it right from the time you were a child. When mommy asks you, what is in your mouth? Yes. Nothing, nothing. You, you already missed it. Yes. You missed it before you became aware that there is a God. Have a shadow, hiya, baba. You missed it. We all missed it from the day we were born. David said, in sin did my, my mother conceive me. I was shaped in iniquity. We missed it. We missed it. So all of us.
us have missed it. And God has placed. The Bible says we all have gone astray. And God, but God, Isaiah, he said we have gone, we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon, oh, ah, ah, the Lord, who did it? The Lord laid upon who? Him. Who is this him we are talking about? Listen, Isaiah was writing about him and yet he didn't know him. This was hundreds of years before Jesus arrived physically. But Isaiah spoke about his execution. Isaiah, and Isaiah gave an interpretation of the cross. Ah! Isaiah told us about what the cross was about. Even though the disciples didn't even have the proper understanding, it was after he resurrected they understood what was written in Isaiah. That is why on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 2, he said that it was not possible that the grave should hold him. Then he quoted, he quoted from David, for David said, You will not leave my, my soul in hell, neither will you leave your holy neither will you leave your holy one to see corruption. He was explaining what was said in the Old Testament. He was explaining the Old Testament coming to life in him. Oh, didn't you see how but the, 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 the um, second Bible reading we, we had today, how the Bible says that they pierce him. And in the verse, John chapter 19, in the verse um, 35, 36, 37, and the Bible says that, that it might be fulfilled which, that which was written. Can you imagine 36? For these things were done that the scriptures might, the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his, his bones was broken. When he was on the cross, every step of the way, scripture was talking. Yes. Scripture was talking. Now, I, I need you to understand, church, body of Christ, Christians, I need you to understand that Jesus' death was not a martyrdom. It wasn't a martyrdom. They, 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 they killed a good man. It wasn't a martyrdom. It was planned. God was the main one behind it. For God did not send, after John 3, 16, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but he sent his son that through, through him the world might be saved. In 2 Corinthians ah, chapter 5, verse 18 and verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, now all things are of God. Of who? Who was the mastermind behind this thing? Who was the mastermind behind the cross? All, th all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Look at the verse 19. I love verse 19. That is God. That is God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. What is the righteous God? Not imputing their trespasses into them. And I've committed the word of so he was in Christ. Just beautiful thing. Can you come please say? Beautiful thing God did on the cross. He was Christ was on the cross, but God was the puppet master. He was in Christ. What was he doing? The cross. The cross, he was finally, he was now reconciling the world to it. on the cross. The cross is the point of reconciliation between God and man. By one man's obedience, oh my God, Romans chapter 5 verse 19, by one man's disobedience, sin passed on all. And verse 19 says that, by, for us by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. So you were made righteous to be able to stand before God. Why? Because of the obedience of, the obedience of this man Christ. This man Christ came. Peter, Satan spoke to Peter, said, no, you can't go to, to the cross. See, Jesus turned to Satan, get behind me. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Get behind me, you devil, Satan. Get behind me. You are trying to block the purposes of God. I'm going to the cross. Nothing can stop me from the cross. Except for this purpose was I born. I must face the cross. That is why Isaiah says that he was led like a lamb. Look at verse 7 in Isaiah chapter 23. Ah, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. 
Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was, uh, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers, he was silent. Point your point said, are you not talking to me? Are you not talking to me? He never made one attempt to defend himself. Wow. Because if he had defended himself, they would all be so guilty. And you and I will still remain guilty. So because, listen, I'm about to drop in a theological word. It's called, this, this is not a theological word. The first one is a normal word, which some of you, I want you to be familiar with. It's called the sin-bearing death of Christ. He bore sins. It's not martyrdom. He went to bear sins. He went on the cross in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Talks about how he gave himself as a ran- verse 5. He gave himself, uh, he gave himself as a ransom for you know what ransom is? You were a slave on the slave market of sin. Someone got to buy you. A price need to be paid for you to be released. I saw, I saw a clip some time ago. Somebody shared it, I think, on Facebook where somebody's son has been, a rich man's son has been kidnapped. And the kidnapper said, we have your son here. He said, which of my sons? Then the boy spoke. He said, daddy, it's me. And he took the microphone, he took the uh, telephone from you. He said, we have his son, and if you don't release the money within 24 hours, we are going to kill him. He was eating. He said, oh, that's what he's been troubling me. Keep him, keep him. <laughs> he said, keep him. Thank you very much. You can keep him, whatever you want to do. <laughs> and then he hung up. The father hung the phone. And the man called. He said, don't you understand what I'm saying? It's your son. We are about to kill him. He said, listen, you are doing me a lot of favor because I've gone through a lot of problems. Keep him, keep him, keep him. <laughs> Jesus on the cross, he became our ransom. Do you know what that means? He became our scapegoat. He was innocent. We are guilty. But the punishment for our sins was laid on him. Who did that? Who did that? God. God. God crushed him for us. So the crushing of all the sins in the world that was supposed to come on each and every one of us, it was piled up by God. And the way you see huge seven-ton rock, seven-ton rock being dropped on another 20-ton rock with a little rat there. <laughs> when we talk about tongue, you are talking about the tongue is is big, big, big stone, heavy stone. You can't carry. You need machines to, and you are putting it on a, a rat. It took grind and crush the rat. The sin of the world. So when they put him on the cross, I want to show you from in Isaiah that it was God venting out His anger against sin. He has vengeance. Christ placated the wrath of God. He pl- God is righteous, so he can't stand sin. And yet we are sinners. How is he going to deal with us? How is he going to relate with us? He's angry at sin, always. God can't stand sin. And we have sinned, and he has to punish sin. And his wrath against sin was always fresh. And Christ came to absorb. That's why he said, the cup that my father has given me, cup to absorb. It's like huge dam, huge dam. When you see dams, this is very strong to block water. Water is very powerful. To block huge dam. And suddenly the dam is crashed and the water, you are standing there, water is crashing on you. And when the water was about to crash on you, suddenly next to you, there was a big cup that absorbed all the water. The cup that crashed. Christ
this was the cup. The wrath of God, like was a dam, coming and is about to sweep you and annihilate you. The wrath of God, you can't stand it. But just when it was coming, you found yourself in Christ, and Christ, oh, the songwriter said, till on the cross, as Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ Still on the cross as Jesus died The wrath of God for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ. Now, the, the punishment that we deserved was not part of it, all of it. Two things I want to make, I want to mention quickly before we finish. Look at Isaiah again. Bible says, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. In Isaiah chapter 53, the verse 8 says that he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generations? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was for, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he was and he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in him. Yet, uh, that's the, the crux. Yet, it pleased the Lord. Now, that word crash, it bruise, mean, it means to crash him. To bruise, he was wounded. It's God's way of crashing him. Some translation will use the word crash. Yet, it, NIV said, yet it was, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Right. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he, he will see his offering and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Look at verse 11 and verse 12. New King James, verse 11 and verse 12. It says that he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And that translation puts it, he shall see the wounds of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant, that's Jesus Christ, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So now, this is the theological word I was about to drop. His death was a vicarious death. Vicarious means in the place of another. So it wasn't his own. He was dying somebody's death. It's like you owe thousand pounds and I go to the bank to go and pay it. And they say, but what's your account? No, no, my name is David, but I'm paying into Richard's account because I'm paying. Okay, they'll receive it because to clear off the debt. So that it's not my debt I am paying, it's somebody's death I am paying. It's not his death. He didn't die his own death. He died our death. He died in our place. Listen, on the cross, he died not because of his sins, but he died for our sins. Don't forget, this is the gospel. He died the cross, he died on the cross for our sins. First Corinthians, you can write this down quickly. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 Bible says that God, Christ uh, Bible says that for I delivered you first for that which I received that Christ died for what our sins according to the scriptures 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 and verse 15 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for the love of Christ constrained us because we judge this if one died what for all did you see that he didn't die for himself he died for all if one died for all then all died verse 5 verse 15 says that, and he died for all. Do you see that? So he didn't die for himself. He died for all. He paid the price for all of us. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24. It says that he bore he himself, bore for he himself, bore our sins. It's not his sin. He didn't have sins, but he was on the cross bearing our sins, paying for our sins. He bore our sins in his own body, not an angel's body. He didn't send an angel to do it for us. He could have sent an angel but I said, 
no, I'm going to come down myself and do it. I'm going to take care of it myself. He did it in his own body. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that signifies that on the cross that we, having died to our sins, might live for him. He died for, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he says that, For Christ also suffered once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. He died on the cross for once or for sins, not for his sins, but for our sins. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, it talks about how he will return again. This time, not, uh, uh, verse 27 says, appointed unto man once to die and after death judgment. Then verse 28, verse 28 says, so Christ was offered once, why? To bear, to bear what? The sins of many. Not himself. He died to bear, this is important, please. This is him. So when you see Christ on the cross, when you remember Christ on the cross, remember your sin on the cross. When Satan comes to accuse you about your sins, when you are in Christ. Show him that it's already paid for on the cross. It's already paid for on the cross. Oh my goodness. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says that we haven't, it says that therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Say, I have peace with God. So when Satan comes and attacks you and says that you used to be a thief, you used to be a criminal, you used to be like that, all the things you have done, you think you have been forgiven, you have not been forgiven, point him to the cross. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says that, For whilst we were yet sinners, uh, God demonstrated his own love towards us in this, that whilst we were yet sinners, what happened? I can't hear you, what happened? What who did Christ die for? Sinner, he didn't die for himself. That's number one. Who was behind his death? God. Bible says that Isaiah chapter 53, again, as I run up, 53, verse 11. Let's look at the verse 12. Verse 12 is very interesting. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. And watch this. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul out uh, unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the, did you see that? He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the strong. He bore the sin of many. He bore the sin, he bore the sin of many. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. I, th I think I like Galatians 1 4. Galatians 1 4 uh, 1 4 please. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins? Uh, what did he do? So he went to the cross willingly. That's why he won't talk back. He said, Pontius Pilate, go on, kill me. Execute me. Campaign for them. He gave himself for our sins. Now let me finish. I keep saying I'm finishing. I keep saying I'm finished. My time is up. Watch this. When the devil says that your sins have not been paid for, what evidence have you got? In John chapter 20, verse 26 downwards, he appeared to them. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, to, and then he, 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 Jesus came, being, the doors being shut, and stood their midst, and he said, peace unto you. And then he turns to Thomas, verse 27. He goes directly to Thomas, and he said to Thomas, reach out your finger, watch this, watch this, watch this. Reach out your finger, reach your finger here, and look in my, in my, in my, and reach out your hand. Here, put it in my side. What about his hands and his side? Because he's the same Jesus who was crucified. But after resurrection, won't the wounds heal? Supernatural body. What do you need wounds there for? No. He's always like this. Jesus is always like this. I paid. Redemption. Redeem redemption accomplished. Redemption accomplished. Redemption accomplished. 
redemption accomplished. The signs. Listen, they bruised him. That's why I said, Bible said he was bruised. Yes. The wounds are necessary to show the flow of the blood. They bruised his brow by crushing thorns on his head. They bruised his hands with the nails. They bruised his side his, with the sword. They bruised his back with the whips. They bruised his face with the blows from the Roman soldiers. He was bruised all over. And the bruise a uh, permanent sign. Oh, Revelation chapter 1. I read it, didn't you see? Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And we ran up. I feel like preaching. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the cloud. And every eye. I will see him, and even those who, yeah. even those who, yeah. the piercing is necessary for our redemption. The piercing is necessary for our justification. The piercing is necessary for our redemption, our freedom. He was pierced. Those who pierced him. Didn't we see in the reading in John chapter 19, verse 34, the soldier took a sword and pierced his side. That's why I told Peter, and so he told Thomas, put your hand there. The wound is just there. The wound is not going. Why? Because it's the evidence of the blood I paid, the price I paid for redemption. I have accomplished redemption. Zechariah chapter 12, verse, verse 10. Chapter 12, verse 10. I need to run up now. Chapter 12, verse 10. It says that, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. The piercing of Christ is the evidence of redemption accomplished. Redemption accomplished. Redemption, because redemption has been accomplished, that means you have been bought. Anyone who is in Christ, who comes to Christ, has been bought from the slave market of sin. The price paid. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am the child. He who the son sets free. the meaning of Christianity. God must remain righteous so he will punish sin. But the sin that was supposed to come to us, the punishment that was supposed to come to us, the Bible says that we all as sheep have gone astray and God has laid the iniquity, the chastisement, the punishment for iniquity upon him. The Lord, we have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the, uh, all of us our iniquity. Verse 3, it says, for the chastisement of, for our peace. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, and we did hit as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we did, uh, we, we did not esteem. Verse 4, let's quickly go to verse 4. Surely he, oh, oh, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem, uh, we, we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and by God and afflicted. Verse, the verse 5 is the one, the key one. He said, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this message by David Entry. We pray you have been strengthened and enlightened. You can connect with David Entry on all relevant social media platforms, including Instagram and LinkedIn. You can also hear more messages from David Entry on all relevant streaming platforms and the Caris Church app. Don't forget to like and share the message. Be blessed.